stream today to talk about the Australian Labor Party. So uh, the party's gone through a couple of shakeups in the last few days. They've recently reshuffled their shadow cabinet. Probably uh, of most importance is that Mark Butler was dropped from the shadow climate change or energy portfolio and was replaced with Chris Bowen. Uh, People are kind of framing this as a win for Joel Fitzgibbons, I think his name is. I don't want to delve too deep into that today, Um, the actual like machinations of the shuffle. What I'm much more interested in is why this happened. And it has to do with policy and the policies that the Labor Party want to take to the next election. Um, The thing that kind of inspired me to stream today, I was browsing Twitter as one does, looking for rage fuel, and came across a tweet that said something along the lines, and uh, I don't, I don't want to name the person, um, said something along the lines of the Australian Labor Party doesn't need a new leader, it needs better policies. Uh, and this was coming from a person who is progressive, um, very obviously so on Twitter. And I was quite interested by that idea because from my perspective, uh, I actually agree with a lot of what, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Uh, Fitzgibbons has to say because what his main claim is is that the Australian Labor Party can have the most progressive climate policy in the world and yet that means absolutely nothing when you're preaching it from opposition. Uh, So there has to be a much more practical kind of policy track to engage with the Australian voters. Uh, Very clearly for the Australian Labor Party, they lost Queensland. I guess this is where Joel and myself differ, he kind of takes a stance that they lost Queensland because they went too hard on climate. I would make the counterclaim that they lost Queensland and didn't gain in Melbourne because they were so wishy-washy on climate. It's one thing to really advocate for strong climate change policies. It's another thing to do that in Victoria and then in Queensland say, well, you know, probably we're not, maybe not going to cancel Adani. But while you're down in Victoria, you're kind of saying, oh, look, yeah, probably we don't want to be moving in that direction anymore. Um, So I think rather than a problem of going too hard, they kind of went too soft and tried to please all at once. Having said that, I I do think there is some uh, relevance to Joel's statements. And kind of after thinking about it for a little bit, it um, occurred to me that what this person was in fact saying Labor needs better policies was that Labor needs more progressive policies and probably particularly when it comes to things like climate change and economic reform, And I guess the issue that I take with that is that it's not a lack of progressivism that's kind of got the Labor Party to where it is. Uh, For full disclosure, I would actually like the Labor Party to be a more progressive institution than what it is now. Uh, Probably generally speaking, I'm sure on certain issues that wouldn't be the case. But generally speaking, I would like a progressive Labor Party in Australia. But having said that, the Labor Party is not losing seats to the Greens. They're not losing seats to socialist and communist groups. You know what I mean? The real contest that the Labor Party is engaged in is a contest for the middle. It's a contest for those in the centre left, centre right, who will vote one way or the other, depending on what they think are better policies, not necessarily more progressive ones. Again, for the sake of disclosure, I have voted for each party, um, I'm not kind of a single party voter. I vote for what I think is the best outcome for the country and for myself as an individual. And I really think that those are the people that the Labor Party needs to be appealing to, not the more kind of progressive elements. Uh, Ultimately, because we have a ranked choice voting or preferential voting system, those that vote left of centre, their votes will end up with the Labor Party anyway. It, It will always feed down... Even if the Greens get 10%, even if blah, blah, blah happens, it doesn't matter. Those votes will feed through to the Labor Party. And so, as I said, the the contest is really for that centre, that centre-right who can be swayed over to the Labor Party, can be swayed over to a more progressive probably policy set than what they would get under the Liberal National Coalition, but they won't buy into that kind of full progressivism that this individual on Twitter was kind of advocating for. Um, so while I was thinking about that, I came across this uh, video here talking about Anthony Albanese and kind of questions that are emerging around his leadership. Um, I wouldn't 
necessarily prediction time. <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily say that he's likely to lose his leadership, but I do think there are questions about his validity moving into kind of the election cycle as opposed to the opposition period cycle. Um, and it, it, you know, it was it was interesting. Interesting. Uh, I'll let it play. How about that? Let's just let it play. Among political tricks, nothing is exactly slow down. How about that? <laughs> We're going to come back to five. You can keep up. In the wings, has a poll. I'm actually going to skip kind of the first part of this. It's an introduction of who Anthony Albanese is. It kind of places him in like this inner Sydney council or something like that. Uh, he's known as the fixer. He refuses to appear on screen. Um, and then there's some quote, and I kind of like this. It, I, it sums up, uh, I guess, what I know of Anthony Albanese quite nice, and it's Paul Keating saying that Albanese was always in the middle. And anytime there was mischief, you could turn around and find Anthony Albanese there. Look, I'll skip through some of this. Um, we know about, like, the Rudd years. Uh, he tried to stop the coup, if you want to call it. It feels a bit weird calling it a coup now. It, I feel like that entered kind of common parlance, or the Rudd coup. And now looking over to the States where, like, there was a legitimate insurgency attempt, it's like, it feels a bit icky calling it a coup. I'm just going to turn the light on. So probably less of a coup, more of a democratic change of power at the head of <laughs> the Labor Party. Um, I'll let it play from... Let's just let it play. How about that? The leader of the House. The government leader of the House, Anthony Albanese, did manage to strike a deal, winning over independent Andrew Wilkie. <laughs> Joined the Labour Party, the factual player, and the man who said in 2012 he was in Parliament to fight Tories. That's what I do. Achieved a lifelong dream in 2019. I have. And so, this was my first introduction to Anthony Albanese. It was the idea that I fight Tories. That's what I do. And even at the time, I remember hearing that and thinking, surely what you're actually doing is advocating for the interests of your constituents, for the interests of the country. I guess you could argue that, like fighting Tories is kind of wrapped up in that, but I would actually want a lot more from like elected representatives. I don't want you just out there fighting Tories, like fighting the other guys just because you can. Um, hopefully we're looking for something a little more productive than that. Hopefully, hopefully. The honour to inform the House that the Australian Labor Party has elected me as its leader. But as 2021 begins, he faces a too familiar drumbeat of criticism and leadership speculation this time about his own leadership. There are major policy brawls within the party, for example, on climate change. But Albanese's problems with his colleagues are more fundamental. They don't think voters are listening to him, and they are not sure he looks like a prime minister. So currently I think uh, we can look this up, but I'm, I'm certain that Albanese has a lower approval rating. Albanese approval, not double P, approval rating. Um... I don't know what essential is. It sounds like something I remember. So two-party preferred vote is like pretty about right. Um, thanks, Firefox. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay. So 60% of male voters support Scott Morrison, only 31%. Select Albanese is the better candidate. Uh, and for women, it's 57 to 26. So fairly kind of stable numbers there. Um, so in general, the electorate doesn't see Albanese as a better like, leader of the country. Which is kind of what you're looking for from a prime minister. Um, here we go, more recent numbers here. So Scott Morrison has an approval rating of 61% as of 23rd, or January 21, whereas Albanese is only at a measly 42%. Well, it's as, it is as opposition leader, not as preferred prime minister. Here we go. Uh, Scott Morrison at 50%, Anthony Albanese at 25% with a bunch of people who don't know. So, <clears throat> excuse me. 
while the two-party preferred voting is kind of about what you would expect it to be not far out from an election, uh, he's getting smoked as preferred prime minister, basically. The last Labour leader to win an election from opposition, Kevin Rudd, had built a place for himself in popular culture on Morning TV. I know you're too well, you're grasping at straws. And campaigned on just a few sweeping promises. National broadband network. Including the NBN, computers in every classroom, too soon. and editing work too choices. Soon, bro. Bill Shorten trailed Scott NBN. Morrison in voter approval ratings right up to the 2019 election. When Albanese took over, he quickly grew even and overtook Morrison through last summer's bushfires, only for the PM's approval to surge with the government's management of the pandemic. In this context, Albanese is struggling to be heard. He has yet to set out a clear policy platform and has not jumped on issues that resonate with the public. So something I noticed when I was doing, I do do the tiniest bit of research before I dive into this. I actually looked up the, here it is here, the Australian Labor Party like policy platform. Um, you know, like how far up from an election are we? Uh, next Australian election. I think it's like later on this year. Like end of the year. What am I? What is this? <laughs> I <laughs> like, am I the one missing this? When is the next Australian election? I feel like that's like a really easy. Uh, I, I know that there's no set date, like I'm not an absolute fool, but surely there's like a basic time frame that we can look at. Here we go. Oh, man, just, <laughs> just election. Just tell me. Oh, bro. <laughs> How many times are you going to say election? Okay, 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 okay. Oh. <sighs> Here we go. Okay. Thank God. So the election, the latest possible date of the next election is within 68 days from the expiry of the House. Therefore, the latest possible day is the 3rd of September, 2022. However, of course, can be called before then. So middle to end of 2022 is the latest possible date for an election. Probably if Scott Morrison is smart, he would call it sooner rather than later um, and ride the coattails of his approval rating from the coronavirus. Uh, probably seems like the smart thing to do. Having said that, I'm no political expert, so I don't know. But the, the reason I brought this up, excuse me, being a year, a year and a half out from an election, I go to Labor Policy's policy, sorry, the Labor Party's policy page, what we stand for. There's five things here. And from my understanding, all of these were announced in the like reply budget that Albanese gave in response to the government's budget. So there's not much for me to grab onto, I guess, is what I'm saying. I know that this happens and that more policies will be announced in the run-up to and the lead-up to the election. But what I would like as someone who tries to do some research, tries to like have an informed vote... I would like to have a bit more time to like evaluate and look at what I'm actually getting myself into. So a little disappointing on my end. I understand why I get it. Um, but yeah, exactly that, as they like said, he's got nothing. He's got no policies out there, really. A couple, but not many. Scrub back a little. Through last summer's bushfires, I think the PM's approval to surge with the government's management of the pandemic. In this context, Albanese is struggling to be heard. He has yet to set out a clear policy platform and has not jumped on issues that resonate with the public, unlike the man he replaced. That has been shocking. People have died, people have lost their job, and you've got these uh, pampers who are having a cry. So funny to see Bill Shorten coming into his own now once he's outside. Like, my problem with Bill, I know that this is just becoming a rant against the Labor Party, but anyway, my problem with Bill is always that, like, he was the script guy. There's a really famous um, video. For those that haven't seen it, and this is why, in my opinion, Bill Shorten lost the election, not because of this particular clip, but because of uh, the sort of thing that it invokes. Um, Bill Shorten, I support the Prime Minister. Let's see if it comes up. Probably would help. Yeah, classic. Classic Bill Shorten right here. Very 
to build your HP down. your time. We're going to slow this down just to get the exact. <laughs> it's only in 480p. Sorry, guys, I'll have to deal with it. Right. Bill Shorten, thanks for your time. Uh, just picking up on Peter Slipper before we get to the Health Services Union, can I ask you, do you think he should return to the Speaker's chair uh, while these civil claims are still being played out? I understand that the Prime Minister has addressed this in a press conference in Turkey in the last few hours. I haven't seen what she said, but let me say I support what it is that she said. Hang on, you haven't seen what she said? But I support what my Prime Minister said. So. Well, what's your view? Well, my view is what the Prime Minister's view is. Surely you must have your own view on this, Bill Jordan. No, when you ask if I've got my view on this, that's such a general question it invites me to go to lots well, of places. Well, it's a specific question as to well, whether Peter Slipper should return as Speaker of your Parliament while he's facing civil claims of sexual harassment. Sexual harassment's an incredibly serious matter. Uh, there should be no tolerance for sexual question, harassment. Either. That's well, my view. <laughs> You get the point, which is that Bill, uh, from my perspective, was always someone that was like slippery. You couldn't like stand there and just say what he actually thinks. It was so funny to see him now coming out and be like, these sorks, tell them to shut up, blah, blah, blah. Back to it. It has intervened. It's sometimes been unclear what the alternative is. The opposition leader is starting 2021 in a limbo land of internal snarking about his leadership, despite the fact there is no clear candidate to replace him. Also, let's just be clear that like, internal snarking about his leadership that's not actually an issue until the media picks up on it as soon as the media picks up on it that becomes the news cycle uh and it puts it creates a bunch of pressures that weren't there initially like anyone can deal with a bit of snarky a bit of like Ugh. but once like an outside party gets a hold of that it's much more difficult to handle and no fixer in sight now polling has been leaked suggesting Labor risks losing two heartland seats at the next election. The polling was commissioned by union allies of former CFMEU boss John Setka. Who is the Labor Party evicted, by, by the way? One CFMEU organiser. The Labor Party, or maybe they didn't succeed, I don't remember. They tried, they tried to evict, and Anthony Albanese personally led this charge to evict John Setka from the Labor Party. So I wouldn't be surprised that, like, <laughs> studies that John Setka has personally paid for all of a sudden show that Labor's going to lose all these seats and blah, blah, blah. Like, come on. You it, I, I have to really listen to that. If they just present that as uncritically as I think they did, that's like actually really shocking from the ABC. And no fixer in sight. Now polling has been leaked, suggesting Labor risks losing two heartland seats at the next election. The polling was commissioned by union allies of former CFMEU boss John Setka, who was kicked out of the Labor Party by Albanese. One CFMEU okay, organiser... Okay. So at least they were clear about that. At least they made that clear. He used the polling to call for Tanya Plibersek to take over as leader. There is talk of a joint ticket of Tanya Plibersek from the left and Jim Chalmers from the Queensland right. But Chris Bowen, Tony Burke and even Bill Shorten's names get mentioned. All the potential... The idea, the, the idea that Bill Shorten will ever lead the Labor Party... I would never say never. The idea that Bill Shorten will lead the Labor Party to the next election is actually laughable. <laughs> That is beyond the realm of stupidity. You may as well, like, dig up Bob Hawke and get him to run again. Because, mate, Jesus Christ. ...histories to overcome and also know that taking on the leadership now would be a poison chalice. Given COVID means incumbency is an even bigger advantage than normal. Thank you very much. Leaderships usually end on a trigger, a bad poll or a gaffe. If the caucus decides it has to move, the so-called Rudd rule, designed to stop the revolving door of leadership, is not considered an impediment. Anthony Albanese, thanks for joining us. Good to be with you, Laura. You often ask the question, what's the point of this government? What I'd like to ask you is, what's the point of the Albanese opposition? Dang. Hold the government to account to make sure for a second during... So again, um, hold the government to account. It's like, yeah, that is what an, that's what an opposition leader would say. What I would like him to say, rather than we're going to hold him to account, is to say, we're going to give the alternative vision for the country. Like... The role of this opposition is to show Australians what it could be, what it should be, and then kind of second is to hold the government to account. Maybe he goes on to say that. I don't know. COVID, that the government acted in the national interest. So we advanced issues like the need for wage subsidies, the need to increase unemployment benefits. The need so this is literally what I'm talking about. Say what you would do if you were in charge. I don't care if you're holding the government to account in a sense. I do care. <laughs> But like primarily what I want is you to stand up and say, this is how it should be. There should be wage subsidies and blah, 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 X, Y, Z. 
for mental health care to be rolled out, uh, the need to have a plan for post-pandemic, uh, uh, as well as uh, put forward alternatives, which we've been doing on issues like childcare reform, on a future made in Australia, making sure that we have advanced manufacturing and jobs, and a plan for to lift wages, lift productivity, and to boost the economy. So to be fair to Albanese, what he's just said is what I wanted him to say. I just wish he would say it with a bit more like, we're here, here's our vision, not just like keep the government to account. That's such, it's like legal ease. No one cares about that. Like the average punter doesn't want to hear, well, you know, we keep into account. We tell them what's what. It's like, no, you get up there and you say what you're going to do because how else am I going to know that I want to vote for you? After the recovery. But do you really think issues like childcare, important as they are, are of themselves important enough to get people to change their vote in such times of uncertainty? And this is kind of exactly what I was pulling on before. I, I don't, I'm not sure that the period of uncertainty matters so much in terms of like the progressive policies. Um, things like childcare, actually, particularly the policy put forth by Albanese, which from what I remember is like near universal government subsidies to childcare up to like a million dollars or something. Um, uh, I swear I saw it here. Women to kickstart. I'll get into this for sure. Okay. Up to half a million dollars, um, which is like the vast majority of the country, the vastest majority of the country. Things like that will change votes. It will I'm just not sure it'll be enough. Well, what it's symbolic of is a plan for the economy. This government doesn't have any reform plan. Uh, they don't have an economic reform agenda. Can you name an issue that Labor has really owned uh, while you've been leader or where your position is absolutely crystal clear? Uh, childcare. That's it? Well, I can name... I can name. Dude, what a, like... <laughs> How's that for a question? Can you name one thing that you've just nailed? Childcare. That's the only one. <laughs> How's that for a question, man? Jeez, that's like it's such a gotcha moment from a journalist and such a like bullshit one as well. Like there was, there was no need for that. And many of them, but that's one. Uh, wage subsidies. Uh, it was Labor that was arguing for wage subsidies to see us through the pandemic. And when we first suggested it, uh, Scott Morrison said that such an idea was dangerous. Increasing New Start is another reform, a future made in Australia, making sure that we, we build trains and other manufacturing capacity here. We've outlined a policy for Jobs and Skills Australia. Now, also, just to go back a couple of things, he says increase New Start. I don't think I've seen a number. There's nothing about it here. Like, it's not even increasing New Start isn't even on their like, list of things to do. What I think he actually means is increasing new start during the pandemic. I don't think, and I'm happy to be wrong on this, I don't think the Labor Party has committed to increasing new start after the election. There we go. Mm, no number. Like they, what I mean by that is they haven't said what they would increase it to. Demands boosting your start, but refuses to commit to size. Yeah. It's... <laughs> the opposition, the Labor Party, which is opposing a Greens bill to increase the payment by $75 a week, says the size of the increase should be decided closer to the next election. So it's like... <laughs> We need time to figure out what the minimum number we can get away with is before we commit to anything this far out from the election. That's funny. Infrastructure Australia uh, I created the last time as we were in government as the minister. Uh, that transformed the way that infrastructure investment happens in this country. Now, the creation of Jobs and Skills Australia to do for the labour market what Infrastructure Australia has done for the capital market. Now, if Infrastructure Australia is anything like infrastructure Victoria at best what it does is suggest like a priority list for infrastructure things that should be built and funded by the government priority a priority b priority c so on if it's anything like infrastructure Victoria they'll do a couple of a's couple of b's couple of c's and then like their big ticket items are the things that aren't even on the list <laughs> so like 
to be fair, I I think that infrastructure Victoria and by extension infrastructure Australia is like such a good idea. But let's not pretend that it like guides government policy when it comes to elections. Like what it does is provide a framework for like bang for your buck, but it doesn't say this will win the next election for you. You should fund this piece of infrastructure. If you like, is a, is a significant reform. Are words like productivity... Uh, reforms to infrastructure Australia, skills Australia, the sort of language that's going to cut through to voters. Well, what will cut through is Correct. a plan for the more The punters jobs. don't care about this shit. The punters work. don't care about infrastructure Australia. They don't care about productivity. Like, the average punter, as far as they're concerned, productivity has been going on for decades and they got fuck all out of it. What the government needs to be talking about, or rather what the opposition leader needs to be talking about while he's in government, while he's trying to become government, is talking about wage rises. <laughs> Talking about wage increases, superannuation increases, like creating more jobs. That's what he needs to be talking about. No one wants to hear about productivity. Only businesses want to hear about productivity because we all know that an increase to productivity does not necessitate, excuse me, an increase to wages. Uh, is a plan for uh, cheaper childcare? Is a plan for lower, lowering emissions and dealing with the climate? Is a plan for recognising First Nations people? There'll be more in coming weeks. Let's talk about Anthony Albanese. I've been quite shocked in the last couple of days by the extent of disappointment and despair felt by your colleagues about Labor's position and yours. They're deeply pessimistic that you can lead them to victory. How is it that you are confronting speculation about your leadership after such a short time? Oh, look, well, my, my leadership's secure. I will continue to advance uh, a, a progressive agenda for Labor. Uh, last year was a tough year for everyone, 2020. And now I actually think Anthony Albanese is a progressive candidate. I mean, if we look at the pol the few policies that they have announced, um, you know, subsidies to childcare, like 90% subsidy for all families, crazy, not crazy bad, crazy good. Like this is massive. I mean, the sort of policies that, it, that they announced, particularly, I think I made a video about the budget reply speech for probably more in-depth analysis so that you can go look there, but like, Anthony Albanese is a progressive leader of the Labor Party. I'm just not sure that's the direction that's going to work for them right now, honestly. Um, again, full disclosure, I would love a progressive Labor Party. I just don't think it's the direction that's going to work right now. I think that when you're up against the Morrison government, high approval ratings, high like, um, you know, you're riding on the coattails of a, of, a, of a global event. You know, we see back in the Howard years, the Bush years, people that were probably due to lose elections one after big events happened. It's really tough. It's so tough to go up against them. I'm wondering if the Labor Party might just sacrifice Anthony Albanese and try to rebuild for the next election cycle. But, like, I, I just don't think they're going to win on a progressive platform like this. I think they need to be much more conservative. <laughs> to win over those voters who kind of see no reason to get rid of Scott Morrison. I think one of the most genius things that Scott Morrison has ever done is bring in the JobKeeper subsidy. As much as Anthony, Anthony Albanese can try and claim that now, it will forever go down as a liberal policy, forever go down as a liberal policy. And it's going to win votes. It's going to win votes because people that would have lost their job otherwise and who otherwise have no reason to vote out the liberals will think, you know what, I only still have a job because of this. Yeah, let's give them another go. They managed it well. They managed the pandemic well. But if you look at the position uh, where we're in, uh, going into what may well be an election year at the end of the year, in terms of all the polling, uh, we're very competitive. Most what a weird camera we'll focus on uh, the people who we need to vote for us rather than focus on ourselves. Have you let Scott Morrison get away from you? I mean, his net approval rating compared to where it was after the bushfires last year has rocketed and uh, there's now a big gap. What a bullshit it. question, man. What an absolutely irrelevant question. Like, his approval rating hasn't gone up because everyone just was like, holy shit, what a good guy. His approval rating's gone up because we had a fucking global pandemic hit the country and they're one of the few places in the world that handed it well. Most important to note here is that the states actually bore the brunt of this in terms of hotel quarantine, border closures, uh, medical uh, like advice and so on, so on, PPE, blah, blah, blah. What the government did do is close international borders and introduce the JobKeeper, JobSeeker subsidies. 
That's like the long and the short of it, really. Uh, national cabinet, probably a good idea. Give all the states somewhere to talk and figure things out. But like, in general, this was a state-led initiative rather than a national one. And because the states did well, Scott Morrison, excuse me, Scott Morrison benefits from that. No, not at all. One of the things that we've seen is that because people during the pandemic have wanted leaders to succeed, of course, uh, that has led to an increase in their approval. Because if they don't succeed, then people have been concerned about their health and about their jobs and their standard of living. Uh, what the next election will be about is about who has a better plan for the future to deliver a, a stronger economy, a fairer society, and deal with challenges such as climate change. Uh, that's what the next election will be about. And I believe we'll be very strongly positioned for it. Even some of your closest supporters are frustrated that you don't take advice. Did you consult, for example, on your idea for a referendum on constitutional recognition being held on Yo. the 26th of January? Okay, so that was one of the most brain-dead fucking things I've ever heard from a politician. Um, let's see if I can... No, I won't pull up the tweet, but, like, the gist of it was Albanese tweeted, like, oh, let's hold a referendum on Indigenous recognition on January 26th, and that will make the day healing day a unifying day. What a load of shit. What a fucking dumb idea. What the fuck were you thinking? Who let him send that tweet? Seriously. One of the worst fucking ideas I've ever heard. Holy shit. It cannot be understated what a brain dead fucking idea that was. Yes, indeed. I consulted way back in 2018. But they seem to think that it was a thought bubble and it was a captain's pick. No, it was in 2018. And it's not put forward as a policy. It's put forward as a constructive idea. How do we have baby well, keep, in the context? Keep your fucking ideas to yourself. Unless you're the leader of the opposition. I don't want to know what your ideas are. I want to know what your policies are. What's your alternative vision for the country? Look, again, people who are like undecided in the centre, maybe they don't care that much about Australia Day, what day it's on, you know, blah, blah, blah. and then you go and post something like that. Let's have a referendum, which like nine times out of ten lose. Let's make it on Australia Day when instead of having a barbecue with my mates, now I have to go and vote. And let's make it about Indigenous issues on an already super divisive day. Like just from start to finish, it is the worst fucking idea. I just, why would you? Of, uh, people like Noel Pearson has put forward the idea of having two days, uh, January 25 and then January 26. How do we... Uh, stop having every January 26 the same debate each year but with more and more division. Now I don't pretend uh, to have uh, the precise solution and that there's a simple solution to then it. Then shut People up. I really want you to succeed, the spear that the mistrust within the caucus is now back at the levels it was when you famously appealed to your colleagues to stop the internal warfare and instead fight Tories. Is that your problem or is it something for others to solve? Well I just don't think that's right. Um, I don't think that's a right characterisation. Well, I'm hearing it from a lot of people in the caucus I, and, I, and not the usual suspects. Yeah, I don't think that's the correct characterisation. I think that 2020 was a difficult year uh, for the entire nation. Uh, we didn't have... Parliament wasn't sitting for most of it. Uh, we had people not gathering in the, in the usual uh, way. And anyone who thinks uh, that the current circumstance is uh, like it was in uh, 2013 that you refer to um, wasn't there in 2013. You're proceeding with a front bench reshuffle. What do you hope to achieve with this? Uh, what I hope to achieve is to, to show uh, what Labor's priorities are. Uh, that'll be announced uh, at, uh, at the weekend. Uh, and uh, I'm talking through uh, with colleagues. I can't tell you uh, our priorities right now. I need a few days to think about it. I've only had three years as the fucking opposition leader. I'm sure that it will achieve a, a stronger uh, team uh, going forward with uh, the right people in the right jobs and uh, it will be, I think, a, a positive move. Somebody made the observation to me that the problem for you is that uh, in finally defeating Bill Shorten and becoming opposition leader, you've achieved your lifetime ambition and that you seem to lack that burning desire to actually become Prime Minister. That was from a Labor person. No, my, my, my ambition is for Labor to be in government. Uh, my ambition has never been about myself. It's about what Labor governments... This is such a dumb question. Who 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 walks into Parliament on their first day and they're like, you know what, I want to be opposition leader, but, man, prime ministership, that sounds hard. I don't want... Nope, not doing it.
dumb as fuck question. What the hell? Can achieve for the sort of people that I grew up with, the sort of people who need Labor governments. For some people, who in government is a bit of an academic exercise. It's something of interest to them. For the people who really need a Labor government, it makes a difference. And I know, uh, growing up, I know the difference that it made to my mum's life, to her pension, to whether she got the health care that she needed. Uh, it made an enormous difference. It wasn't an academic exercise. And for millions of Australians, that's the case today. They need a Labor government, which is why that should be our only focus. Anything else is self-indulgent. They deserve for us to acknowledge the privileged position we're in and that we have a responsibility to do our best for them. Thanks for talking to us. A good point, actually, and echoes a lot of what uh, Fitzgibbons was saying, which is that without getting into government, you can't do anything for the people that need you in government. And I think that's a really important point to make. It's If what he's saying is true, we, we take it at face value, of course, that it's not about personal ambition. It's not about holding government for the sake of holding government. It's about helping the people that need help and need a Labor government in charge in order to make their lives better. I think that's a very uh, valiant and valuable thing that Albanese is bringing to the table. And you know what, as well, like where's this side, where, you know, probably I think the interview starts around like six minutes into this video. Where's this guy for the last six minutes? Because before this, I'm getting like, oh, you know, we just hold the government to account. Blah, blah. And I was like, no, you know what? Actually, there's people whose lives are drastically worse when we're not in charge and we need to be in charge for those people so that we can protect them, make their lives better. They need us. Where's this guy five minutes ago? Very infuriating as someone that would like a more progressive country. Tonight. Thanks, Laura. Hi, I'm Lee Sales. Thanks for... And there we have it, folks, a little bit of insight into the mind of the Labour leader. Um, to those of you on Twitch, thank you for joining me. And to those watching on YouTube, thank you as well. Until next time.